This is Reverend Kirk Lawton, minister at Ocean Lakes Family Campground, and this is our podcast. Our prayer is that this message may enrich your life as you find God especially meaningful to you. Thank you for worshiping with us. Several years ago, a student who came from a rather moderate financial background was seeking to work his way through seminary. Since all the regular campus jobs, such as working in the library, the dining hall, the paint crew, so forth, all these jobs were already filled, this boy was given the job of caring for the grounds around the president's home, the president of the seminary. This job in itself was not too difficult. It involved mowing the lawn, raking leaves in the straw, carrying away the trash in a wheelbarrow, But the difficult part of his job was by reason of the helper he had. And that helper was the five-year-old son of the president of the seminary. When the student would mow the lawn, the little boy would help by riding on top of the mower. When the student tried to rake leaves, the little boy used the rake as a hobby horse to ride. When there was a load of trash to be carried away in the wheelbarrow, The five-year-old boy was always quite helpful by perching himself atop the load, ready for the ride. Well, one day as the two were out in the yard, working quite some distance away from the house, there came a loud call from the house, David! But the little boy seemed not to hear. Then it came again, this time a little louder, David! When the little boy did not even look up, The seminary student said to him, David, I think somebody's calling you. To this, the little boy replied, oh, that's just Alberta. Alberta was the maid. After only a moment, there was a third call for the boy. The seminary student looked up from his raking, but the little boy was already gone. As he trotted toward the house, he called back over his shoulder, I got to go now. That's mama calling me. (laughs) You see, To this little boy, it made a great deal of difference who had spoken. To us also, it makes a great difference who is speaking to us. When a person speaks to us who really has something important to say, we better listen, hadn't we? And when God speaks to us, then we surely must take notice and listen. Has God ever spoken to you? I can probably answer that question for you. Yes, he has. Now, you may not have heard his voice with your ears. You may not even have recognized his voice. You may not have even thought it to be important, even as David regarded Alberta's voice. But God has spoken to you. How has he spoken? First, God has spoken in a world he has created. The psalmist David said, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Another person says, the heavens are the mind of God, the systems are his word, and he has left his signature on every bush and bird. It's beyond my capability to understand how some individuals can look about them in a season of the year such as we're in right now, and then turn and profess that all this beauty and order in the world of nature could just be by happenstance. You may have heard the story about a farmer who was out plowing one day, plowing his land, and the plow uncovered in the soil a pocket watch. Now, this farmer had lived all of his life in the backwoods area of the land. He had never before seen a pocket watch. So, as his curiosity worked on him, he took that watch that weekend to a gathering of some of his friends, and he asked them, if they could suggest how this strange piece of metal could have come into being. One of his friends said, I know how it came to be. It was just a matter of timing and luck. For some place on the earth, there came forth some pieces of metal. And then from another place on the earth, there came some other similar pieces. And these, all these pieces just sort of flew together one day in such a manner that those little wheels inside were perfectly formed, fitting together at perfectly the right place. And also, while this was happening, there were some jewels which came out of the heart of the earth, 
compressed there, hardened by intense heat. These jewels began sailing through the air, which smoothed them to just the proper size and shape, and they slammed into those other metallic parts in such a way that they fit in exactly the right place. And then when all of this was set in order, then I absolutely by chance, there was an enormous compression of sand and lead and all the other things that made up that smooth, shiny outer covering that you're looking at. And this just slammed together in such a way as to fit together perfectly. The farmer concluded by saying, and so you see, this thing came to be what you've got in your hand. That came to be just by chance of all those things hitting together correctly. There was no plan, no purpose behind it all, only a mere happenstance of an accident. Now, if this explanation of how a pocket watch came to be sounds to you like utter nonsense, then how much more foolish is the position of the person who claims that this world just happened? Maltby Babcock wrote, This is my father's world, the birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. Yes, God has spoken to us in a world he has created. But God has spoken, spoken to us in another way. He has spoken in a book he has written. Louis Benazet, who was formerly a, a college president out in California, tells of his brother-in-law whose favorite prank many, many years ago was to drive into a service station. And back in those days, they had service stations, not just gasoline fill-up stations to serve yourself, but they actually, actually offered service. So he drove into the service station and the attendant came out and, and this brother-in-law would say to the attendant, am I halfway there yet? Of course, the attendant would usually ask, well, where are you headed? And the prankster would reply saying, oh, I'm going to Boston. It usually took the attendant a little while to realize that he'd have to know where the trip had begun before he could answer that first question, am I halfway there yet? We need to know not only where we're going, but we also need a knowledge of the past, where we came from. The past is important and our only source of most of the facts of our spiritual past lies in the book we call the Bible. You and I could not be present when a man named Abraham ventured out in faith into a new land, a land which he didn't even know about. We could not sit on the sidelines and watch Abraham take that step of faith from Ur to Canaan. But there's a record of that venture. You and I could not be physically present back in the 8th century B.C. when a prophet named Amos stood up and shouted out against the injustices and the immorality of his day, boldly proclaiming, Thus saith the Lord. We couldn't hear that, but there is a record of this prophet's life. You and I could not follow John the Baptist or John the Baptizer as he walked about, preparing the people for the later ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, as he said, prepare ye the way of the Lord. We could not sit together on the hillside beside the Sea of Galilee and hear Jesus preach that powerful moving sermon on the mount. Nor could we see him heal the lame, restore sight to the blind, raise the dead, restore sanity to those who had lost their mental control, or take some bread and fish and feed 5,000 people. We couldn't see all that but there is a record of all this. And you and I could not stand at the foot of the cross on that Black Friday and see the Son of God give his life to die for our sins, nor could we witness the fact of an empty tomb. But some did stand there, and some did see that open grave, and they left us a factual record. This record is God's holy word, the Bible, a book through which God has spoken to us and through which he continues to speak when people will let him speak through its pages. How has God spoken? Well, not only through a world in which he's created, not only through a book he has written, 
but also God has spoken and a son he has given. The author of Hebrews says, In many and various ways God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by a son. 101 years ago, in a large metropolitan hospital, there was a mother who was about to give birth to her child, but complications had developed, and the doctors had to tell her that they'd be able to save only one life, either her life or her baby's. Without hesitation, she said, let the baby live. The next day there appeared a rather brief but pathetic note in the morning newspaper. It read as follows. Yesterday at General Hospital, a young mother laid down her life that her son might live. Eighteen years later, a young man went to a certain cemetery there in that city and stood over a certain grave as he held a high school diploma in one hand and a yellowing piece of newspaper in the other hand. That used newspaper read, Yesterday at General Hospital, a young mother. There were tears in the boy's eyes as he stood over his mother's grave realizing her sacrifice for him. And to himself and to God, that young man muttered, if somebody thought enough of me to give up her life to let me live, then by the help of God, I'm going to make every effort to live the kind of life that'd be worth dying for. And so for these remaining years, many people have been blessed by the life of one pastor who has given himself to the Lord in gratitude for the life that God gave to him that day. Does it seem strange to you that out of all the records we have of the life of Jesus, that his biographers spent so much time and space covering the news of his death? Actually, one-third of Matthew's gospel, one-third of Mark's gospel, one-fourth of Luke's gospel, and about half of John's gospel all are devoted to the last 24 hours of the life and death of Jesus Christ. Yes, his death is important because he was dying for the sins of all the world, your sins and my sins included. For God so loved the world. Many thousands of years later, a man named J.P. Morgan, who was the richest man in the world at, at, at his time, made the statement, my only hope of heaven is through that death and that shed blood. But if this story of God speaking had stopped right there, then all I've said so far this morning would be nonsense. Jesus did remain in the tomb for two days. And as those days passed, many people dismissed this prophet from Nazareth as merely another Messiah who had come and gone. But on the morning of that third day, the first day of the week, Sunday as we think of it, his disciples discovered an empty tomb with the stone rolled away. And because of this fact, his life and death have meaning for us today. This is the cornerstone of our faith, the resurrection of Jesus. Paul said it in his letter to Corinth, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, For if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also in vain. But that's not the case. We now serve a Savior who could not be kept in the grave. For he rose from the dead and now lives in triumph. And soon, we know not how soon, he's coming back to this earth to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. And his kingdom will be composed of all those who now serve him and follow in his way and he shall reign forever and ever. Yes, God has spoken to us in a world he has created, in a book he has written, and in a son he has given. And God will speak to you right now if you listen. Respond to his voice and say, Yes, I want this God revealed in his son Jesus to be my King of kings and Lord of lords. 
Father, this is our prayer that we pray in the risen Jesus Christ's name. Amen.